Hi, my name is Mark Ward and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Redline Book Festival 2020. The festival is brought to you by South Dublin Libraries and Arts. British novelist Adam Maris Jones kicks off our In Conversation series chatting to poet and critic Sean Hewitt. Adam will be discussing his latest publication, Box Hill, available to order from our festival bookseller, The Gutter Bookshop. But now, get ready to don your biker jackets and ride pillion as we enter the world of Box Hill. Hello everyone and welcome to this event with the Redline Book Festival, where I'll be talking to the novelist and critic Adam Mars-Jones um, about his novel Box Hill, which was published earlier this year. It's a wonderful novel and I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to talk to Adam and I'm sure it would be a great conversation. Um, if you don't already have a copy of the book, I urge you to go out and buy one. Uh, it looks like this. Um, it's beautiful and it's a beautifully disquieting book, I found. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce and welcome Adam Mars Jones virtually to Dublin and to this year's Redline Book Festival. Adam is the author of numerous collections of short stories. He's a very eminent critic and contributor to uh, The Guardian, the TLS, the LRB. Uh, in 2008, Adam published Pilkrow, uh, the first novel in what I believe is a proposed trilogy of books told by the protagonist, John Cromer. Um, Cromer's one of the most unusual characters in recent literature, I think. Uh, he grew up gay and disabled in the 50s and his inner world is really meticulously and vividly painted by Adam. In 2015, he published a memoir, Kid Gloves, A Voyage Round My Father, about his relationship with his father. Adam was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature in 2007, and earlier this year, as I mentioned, published Box Hill, A Story of Low Self-Esteem, which won the 2019 Fitzcarraldo Prize. And it's that book that we have the pleasure of talking about today. Um, Adam was a uh, Brianna Staunton Visiting Fellow at Trinity College Dublin, where I work uh, in 2019. And in fact, that's where I first heard him read. Uh, I was struck then, as I'm sure you will be today, by the power, uh, but also the vulnerability of that reading, um, the quite disarming blend of comedy and poignancy. Um, Box Hill is, uh, as I said, a really disquieting uh, devastating book, um, and it works through a combination of understatement and suggestion. Uh, it's both sexy and uncomfortable, uh, comic and also sad or even tragic. Um, Adam, welcome. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be talking to you. Um, rather than summarizing the book myself, um, perhaps you'd like to start by just introducing the readers to Box Hill, and then um, perhaps you could read an extract from the book. I don't think introducing helps. I mean, it's a first person. It's somebody looking back on a relationship that formed them starting 18th birthday at Box Hill, where the bikers go on a Sunday. Uh, and he finds himself moving in with this guy pretty much without his consent. And yet, in some way, he does consent. And this is an episode from early on in their relationship. One Saturday morning, a month after I'd moved in, Ray went downstairs to clean the bike, as usual. And I borrowed a tall stool from the kitchen and sat in the lounge window watching him do it. Cardinal's paddock was a quiet cul-de-sac the sort of place driving schools send their cars on a Sunday afternoon to practice three-point turns. But I was always amazed at Ray's trust in the world. He never even locked the bike. Essentially, it was protected by its beauty. It didn't even have a lock on the petrol tank, so all it would take would be a teenager with a match and the thought, why should he have that if I can't in his head? and Ray's great treasure would be all flame and melting. I took up my position on the kitchen stool and watched him at work. He was very thorough. He even drew a clean cloth tenderly back and forth between the spokes of the wheels. I saw a motorcycle being flossed long before I ever knew you could do the same thing with teeth. For the hour or so it took him to clean the box, 
bike and did this. He never once looked up. A few minutes after I had perched on my stool, it began to bother me that it didn't show any signs of noticing me, as if I was so insignificant I was invisible. But he knew I was there. Obviously, he knew I was there. It was like those Russian experiments in the paranormal we used to hear so much about. If someone predicts the cards being turned up 100% of the time, then it can't be coincidence. That's proof of ESP. Proof that mind reading is a reality. But if someone never guesses a card right, not ever, it can't be coincidence either. That proves ESP too is just not so crude a proof. Obviously, Ray knew I was there watching him the whole time. Otherwise, he would have had to look up at least once in a solid hour. Law of averages. So he knew I was there the whole time. He chose not to acknowledge me. As for why he preferred the subtler way of showing we were attuned to each other, well, one way sharing was the sort he liked best. I can't explain it any better than that. One way sharing was the sort he liked best. As for why, I have no idea. It's what worked for him. And in fact, after Ray had paid me no obvious attention for a while, it seemed to me that the atmosphere below me had changed. The air gradually thickened and clotted with secret excitement. Ray's movements never speeded up or became flustered, but they were more and more loaded with sexual consequence. By the time he'd polished the last square inch of elegant and potent metal, my heart was in my mouth. By now I was dreading him looking up as much as I had wanted to happen when I started to watch. If he looked up, oh God, if he winked at me, the whole extraordinary moment would fall to the ground and blow away. Luckily, Ray was not winked, but he never looked up never broke the spell. I stayed watching him until the bike was gleaming, but before I heard the front door open, I'd returned the stool to the kitchen, keeping my side of the bargain so there was no visible evidence of the whole little drama played out between us in the lounge below the window. Thank you. I think what really comes across in that segment, we, we could almost extrapolate um, so many themes from the book from that one segment. Um, but the sexual tension is is really clear in that, and it's it's not clear in some ways if the sexual tension is imagined or if Ray's actions are particularly um, sexy or meant to be sexy, or if it's all kind of in the head of, of Colin. And that's a, an interesting dynamic that plays out through the book in that Colin is this very vulnerable and in some ways unknowing narrator, but then he also knows a lot and he, and he gives uh, to us as we go through all of these hints that he knows what's going on and perhaps he prefers not to believe certain things or um, prefers not to see them in certain ways. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about that unequal power dynamic that's really central to the book. Like, what is it about that that interested you and where did these characters come from? I'm not even sure it's equal, but it is asymmetric. And we make out that relationships are inherently symmetrical when they're more often asymmetrical than not, really, in parents and children are not symmetrical relationships, you know, any relationship of power power is not symmetrical. So I think we have an obsession with imposing uh, symmetry when there are other ways of having balance. Uh, and I'm, I'm fascinated by it, but I think probably because I'm such a literary creature, probably not power, but power on the page and the way there is no such thing as weakness in narrative. Because if you control the point, it's your story. And however weak you think you are, or however you perform weakness, you are in charge. So, so the very fact of telling the story 
is the only power that matters in a first-person narrative. And I think I, I first formulated that. I mean, you've mentioned I'm a critic as well as a writer. Often I realize things more clearly when reading other people's story my own. So it was reading Martin Amon's uh, short story in 1989 uh, from the collection of Einstein's Monsters, where there was somebody who was like a sort of Woody Allen stand-up telling you how pathetically weak he was and how strong the world is. And that's when I thought, hold on, you're the one with the microphone. And that's what matters. Uh, you, know, the, you can say everybody in the world is, is stronger than you, but as long as you hold on to that microphone, you have the last laugh because you determine what is said and what is not said. So it's more that that interests me. And the novel you mentioned with a disabled narrator is a sort of extreme version of that because he is so helpless. And yet you have to enter his world. You can't bring him into yours. So it's that sense that there is also an asymmetrical but balanced relationship between, between reader and writer, that the reader is not in a position of power, but their participation and above all their surrender is the only thing that makes the whole thing work. So you know, a reader who is not pulled into your narrative, there's nothing you can do about that. All you can do is hope it doesn't happen. But once they surrender, it is their energy that makes the whole thing work. And you can say the same thing about Colin in Box Hill, that although he seems to be the despised, the ignored, it is his energy that makes everything happen, however little he thinks he has agency. People used to not say agency, they used to say power, but agency is, is, is what to say. Yeah, it's interesting that um, you, you identified what was what was misleading in my question, really, in um, in asking about power dynamics, because in some ways, uh, Colin, as you say, he has the imaginative power in this in this book, uh, and in some ways, it's it, I read it as being an initiation into a fantasy world that also butts up against reality in in some ways, and. Um, you, you draw on this really uh, resonant queer aesthetic, uh, kind of get this sense of Tom of Finland um, biking gangs in the in the seventies, and I wonder if there was something uh, exciting or or, um, or or the possibilities of this um, romanticized, idealized sexual image and. Um, the vulnerability of the character as well, or perhaps not even vulnerability, but his um, his constant butting up against uh, what is real and what is sometimes quite humdrum in the setting of the book, and this um, romanticized sexual um, being that's Ray. Um, was there something about that? Um, the comic potential, perhaps, or the or the tragic potential of of that uh, dynamic between the idealized and the and the real in the book that attracted you. I like the idea that when you're reading, there can be a sudden jump, as people may notice. There has been in the recording for technical issues. I like the fact that there are hairpin tone uh, hairpin bends in the writing, which mean you go from sort of Alan ben Bennett territory of, you know, scones, National Trust, coziness, Mensa membership, and then it's something really quite stark and, uh, and apparently brutal. I wanted those to be quite hard to negotiate for the reader. And the risk is that some people will say, this is not for me. Uh, it's either badly done or it just represents uh, too violent a transition and I can't cope. But I wanted people to make their own, to construct their own uh, continuity or not, because not everything is, not everything joins up. Uh, and even there's an element of mischief in it. Uh, I think, I don't know if that was apparent to you, but there's an element of mischief, partly because gay readers will understand that this world, this subculture is completely made up. Uh, it's uh, It has some resemblances to some of the things that guys get up to, but it's deliberately very stylized and artificial and frankly, rather boring by most standards. If you know what people have ended up being prosecuted for at various stages, you know, unfairly for things they've done by consent to each other, then you know this is really quite tame. But uh, I think I was, I took the cue from a dramatist called Tony Marchant, who wanted to 
do a series or, or a television play, I think it, uh, um, uh, on BBC 15 years ago, maybe, uh, in which he wanted to talk about the effect of an illness in a child on a family and decided to make up his own illness rather than tie it to a particular condition. So he invented this illness and consequently there was nothing at the end saying if you have uh, if you have problems with this made up thing uh, and i thought that was the way to go that this really slightly insane fantasy world of poker clubs and uh, ritualized uh, submission uh, which most gay readers would think even in the 70s that was not how people spent their time but straight readers who 30 years ago would have thought that anything involving gay people was unwholesome, now think, oh, well, they have their own ways. <laughs> and there's a tremendous artificial reluctance to moralize. And I thought, well, let them moralize, because who's to say these guys aren't getting up to really pretty sick stuff? Uh, and why shouldn't the reader have an opinion? So there is an Olympic mischief there. But also, I think an awful lot of writing, particularly about gay sex, is artificially lyrical. It makes out that this is some sort of exquisite set of sensations. I mean, the sort of classic trope is something like his armpits smelled of the white truffles that the peasant women sell on the stone benches at Piacenza on, a, on an August morning. Uh, and I wanted to have something that was not lyrical, where the meaning of the sex was largely symbolic that it was largely to do with the satisfaction of a role or a performance rather than a necessarily pleasant or beguiling set of uh, sensations. Uh, but that is, that is not a popular route. I think my gay brothers do like a bit of, uh, a bit of spun sugar to be involved. Well, in some ways, it's interesting to think about uh, why that might be uh, in terms of the way that gay literature has, has evolved over time. Because um, we might think that sugarcoating things was really uh, for a straight audience, you know, to make things a bit more palatable in some ways. But you've imagined, like you say, you've imagined this um, or parts of this subculture and invented parts of your own. Um, but you've also gone to extreme lengths, really admirable lengths, I think, um, to pin this novel in sociological detail. Like I was thinking of, a, a, struck by a few examples of, um, uh, there's one point where you mentioned the, uh, the range of conditioners, hair conditioners, and, and you, you know exactly how, how that works, um, or worked in the 70s. And also even just down to the language, uh, there's a moment where Colin tells us that um, he would have, been accused of overreacting if people said people overreacted in the 70s. So you have this imaginative world, but you also have this, you, do you research that detail or, or um, do you just have an extraordinary memory or are you inventing some of it? How, how does that work? Speech is very difficult to research. Uh, mm. because, uh, but often you get the feeling when you're reading something of a soft anachronism, when something it, conveys the right thought but in the wrong language, even in tiny things. I had a student who was writing a memoir of, of being a, a doctor in the 1980s, and she said something about, you know, so-and-so brought me a cup of tea, and I said, you star, and it just seemed slightly wrong. And nowadays, completely neutral, but I think you star was not quite what people said and trying to work out what they did say. You know, the way the adjectives change, the way wicked and brilliant go from being youth talk to uh, hopelessly out of date. All of those things do interest me, largely because a little of it can uh, can stabilize a lot of unreal stuff that it, it is particularly useful as ballast to make you believe something that really is quite, uh, is it requires the reader's consent to be anything close to real. Yeah, because, I mean, the form of the book, it kind of takes the form of a almost a memoir or, or a coming of age uh, tale. So you're right that those, those points of detail are really uh, important in us grounding us in some sort of reality that you can then move off from and, and um, take a, a few flights of uh, fancy. Um, I was thinking about when you mentioned the words there. I remember very clearly thinking when I was a when I was a child that um, other people would use the word kids to describe children, and that seemed a new word in the '90s. Maybe like an American word that I I wasn't fully comfortable with using myself. So I would always say children because I, I felt like I was putting on 
airs or, or a show if I said kids. Um, or, or it's chosen a beautiful example because that is how it feels. But if you read Ford Maddox Ford's Good Soldier, which is what, 1910? It does use kids in exactly that way. Well, you know, there are some things you just notice, like uh, the idea of the ensuite bathroom. That appears in Sheridan Lefnew's My Uncle Silas, about 1860. It says a bathroom en suite, Irish writer, good reference for this, for this dog. <laughs> you know, there's surprising things that, that stick out. And we think, how weird, because it's right, but it feels wrong. And you, mm. have to, you have to play that by ear a little bit as you go along to make sure that you, that you don't make it look like a list of, oh, do you remember such and such a suite? Or do you remember when such and such a record was number one, where you try to underplay it? And I suppose Pilko is practice for that because my hero is a bit older than me and his range of reference uh, sort of blends into mine, but has its own distinctive distinctiveness. So he'll have had mm. his own separate to, uh, memories of radio programs and so on but they were also they changed much more slowly then uh, the yeah. constant recycling of things uh, is more recent yeah and it's also i suppose um cultural and contextual as well not just uh, in terms of of history at different places use different words and have different um things mm. in their uh, supermarkets and stuff I, I remember speaking to um my mum and she said oranges were a treat when she was little and then i remember reading jane eyre and thinking well jane eyre got oranges in the orphanage so i was what world <laughs> did my mum grow up in uh, so obviously it depends where you live um as much as when you live it's also um, fascinating just see the way a word can remain and change in its in its meaning so horny used to mean you were turned on by somebody so you were horny meaning you were sexually aroused and then it becomes a word applied to somebody who makes you horny in the older sense so you're mm. really horny it doesn't mean you're excited but you excite me or that was my last take on this yeah. Yes. yeah i'm sure that these things change so quickly it's hard to tell um so i i wonder like thinking about the the historical setting of the book um even though it does reach through to the 90s i suppose is that the perspective like from that. which it's being told um and and the the physical setting box hill um we might remember that from jane austen's emma there's a picnic on on box hill but yours is a very uh, different box hill in a different time and place um and I wondered why it was that you chose that place and that time. Uh, what was it about the potential of that setting and time that made made it a good uh, place to uh, to set this? Well, it, it really was where the bikers went on a Sunday. It was the great gathering place. But the story was told me, the basic outline of the story was told me by somebody as something that had happened to him. The 18th birthday at Box Hill being sort of kidnapped and kept, but in a surprisingly open arrangement where his parents knew and approved, although they obviously didn't know the details. And I do like having a real armature to plan my effects round. Uh, and so I transformed it completely. Uh, and I did show it to the friend it was, whose life it was based on. And I thought he'd say, how dare you take these crucial episodes in my life and turn them into your fantasy? But instead he said, oh, it brought back those happy days. And I thought, really? <laughs> <laughs> because I, this is a book that shocks its author. I mean, it sounds pitiful to say so, but I do find this material shocking. The thing that I find shocking or the thing that is very alien to me is what psychologists call abjection. You know, a complete inability to make decisions, a complete not even passivity, but a, a complete refusal to occupy the territory that the ego should claim for itself. So I do find that sort of makes my skin crawl uh, in practice. And it took effort to make myself understand that this was a viable and even truthful way of dealing with the world for this character. Uh, as for Box Hill, uh, this, this may, you may find this funny. Uh, somebody got in touch who was doing a blog 
uh, on the Rygate Dorking area, and therefore including Box Hill, and asked me, you know, why did you choose Box Hill? And have, you know, do you have childhood memories of Box Hill? And after a while, you find yourself saying things like, well, Box, it suggests enclosure. Hill suggests visibility. Um, so they're already opposed. And have you noticed they have no letters in common? So they just sit there on the page looking at each other. And after a while, you think, I almost believe it. Well, yeah, I mean, you say at the start of the book, you um, let me find the quote, but you're uh, talking about the the box um, and uh, the, the the meaning of it and how, how the um, how the, pet, the the leaves are, and um, uh, it sounds it sounds like a poem you can't quite get the sense of, uh, and I thought that was a really um, fun, but also kind of prescient way of introducing the book because I was going to ask you about. Uh, this this question of abjection because um, you have a, a subtitle to the book which is somewhat rare in in contemporary novels uh, I suppose to have Box Hill a story of low self esteem um, I wondered why why you chose to have a subtitle for the book and um, it, it struck me as interesting because um, it almost sets it up as if we might. Uh, learn something or have a moral or a parable from the book but the book kind of like that poem that you can't quite get the sense of doesn't it is, doesn't set out to me to, t to teach us something um it doesn't resolve into some sort of moral um so so what were, what were your thinking what was your thinking about having that subtitle what did you hope it might do for the well, book. The, the the Fitzcarraldo, we talked about whether it should stay or not, because there was a feeling that it potentially misdirected, because at the end of it, if you think, oh, yes, I've just read a story of low self-esteem, then I failed. Obviously, it's meant to move into very different territory from that. But I did quite like the idea of that, just the fact that if you write a novel that's in the first person, uh, the title in this case is what Colin would choose for his story because it's where it all started and it's where the story mm -hmm. ends. So the subtitle is the only area where I can mischievously semaphore something at you. And as I don't like epigraphs, I mean, when I open a book, I don't want something that shows how much the writer has read. You know, I don't want a, a text that points you towards, you know, here's what I was going for. I mean, some people bring it off, but natively I prefer the book to make its own way. And then of course I break my own rules by having this sly little suggestion. And, and you're right, I don't want it to have a moral element because uh, the only, if I had a commonplace book, it would just have a single quotation in it, which is from Witold Gombrowicz, where he says, literature is like the eel. It survives by wriggling away. If you caught the eel, what would you do? You'd eat it. Literature and the eel survive by wriggling away. If it doesn't wriggle away, if it's too easy to review, to sum up, then you should have done something else. Well, yeah, you're right. It's quite, um, it's quite a mischievous uh, subtitle. It seemed um, wry to me when I read it because it offsets something um, specific and concrete, Box Hill, it's quite an authoritative title in some ways, um, with this sly undercutting that um, seems to already give us a sense of comic potential as well in this um, in this way that your, your prose often does uh, have this understatement uh, that's that's very funny um, and it's um, and it comes you know when you were saying you found perhaps it was it was dangerous in some ways to offset uh, these darker things against the um, the more ordinary things uh, that's really where the the discomfort comes in and the and the discomfort is funny in some moments and then in other moments it's it's discomforting um, and that's quite a, a fun thing for a reader because you don't ever quite know where to settle yourself and things take you um, catch you off guard and you don't know whether something is about to be a joke or whether it's actually going to turn into something darker um, and that keeps you on your toes because it's it's quite a, a short book for you um, and I wondered really if there was something about the the form of the book we, we often kind of think of um, you know a, a long form uh, novel as you as you've written with uh, with Pilcrow and, and Sedilla there's uh, a lot of space 
to work with, but you're also quite a master of the short story. So I wonder what led you to adopting this kind of middle middle form. Did this seem to you a story that um, emerged as a short as a short story? Uh, did, like, did you see its form as you were thinking of it, um, or or is it just uh, something to um, to publish while you're working on something bigger as well? You know, like, is, it, is it a bit of freedom? <laughs> No, I, I, it did need to be longer than a story because the element of passing of time, the element of, of quite a sustained retrospect uh, and the mixture of you wanting to know what happened and Colin trying to understand what it meant. I mean, those two needed to stabilize each other to some extent. But the thing that I do seem to be drawn to is continuousness. Uh, and that does date from when I published my first novel, which is also quite short. It's a bit longer than this, but The Waters of Thirst, 1993, where I wanted it to be all in one breath, partly because I knew that if you have a reputation as a short story writer, the reviewers will either say, this is a bunch of short stories that don't really hang together, or this is just one story that has outstayed its welcome. And I thought, well, you can't, you can't prevent both of those, but you can try to make sure it doesn't look like a set of loosely linked sketches. So I wanted it to be very continuous. In other words, no chapter breaks. And I've never mm -hmm. gone in for chapter breaks, which I can see is slightly oppressive to the reader because and it's perfectly respectable to say, I just want to read another chapter before I turn out the light. That's absolutely mm -hmm. defensible bourgeois pleasure. <laughs> but I like the fact that if you make it continuous, then the tension is continuous in the way that knitters use the word tension. In other words, the stitches are the same size. Uh, whereas if you stop something and then start again, uh, it seems to me that you aren't necessarily maintaining um, the same tone, the same angle. Uh, you're, it's like you're saying, I'll have a cup of tea and come back to it. But actually, I would rather stay with it and see what the point of view yields. So even Pilker and Cilla, which are enormous, are written as continuous huge slabs and then cut up for the reader's convenience on the page. But that, you know, it's because the reader deserves relief. Uh, and even Kid Gloves, which is about 250 pages long, there's no chapter breaks. And I can see that that's potentially quite oppressive. But the, the advantage to me is if there is a moment where I do want there to be a lot of feeling or where I want to have a joke and something quite close to a punchline, I don't want to have that moment where there's a bit of blank space and you're, it's like it echoes with either the emotion or the laugh. I like mm. the feelings to be reabsorbed by the reader and somehow enrich the whole experience rather than be pulled out too obviously. And, and those aren't mm. quite technical considerations and I can see there must be some deeper reason for me to go on doing it, but I do like a single shape if at all possible. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, as a reader, I experienced it in, in just that way, I think, in that you're never given the chance to compartmentalize certain events that happen in the book. So as you read them, you have the um, the memory of one of them still happening as you, as you approach another. Mm -hmm. So they kind of overlay in some ways. Um, you have the discomforting things lining up against the comic things, lining up against the humdrum things. And, and that keeps us on our toes in a way, because we don't. it's not like this is a comic chapter, this is a tragic chapter, this is a, a darker chapter. We're going on different parts of the journey now. Um, and I think in some ways, the way that you've chosen to tell the story um, retrospectively, there's this, you were talking about that uh, knitting um, metaphor that the the idea that there's a tension and there's the tension that runs all the way through the book is because it's being told backwards in some ways uh, and and so we there's always this end point that we're getting to and everything is kind of strung on that thread and and it's pulling pulling tighter as as we go as we go on and then at the end um in fact, I, I don't want to. I don't want to talk about the end of the book because I, I want to make sure that people um, read it if they haven't already. So let's scrap that. Um, I would like to ask you um, about. You, I mean, you mentioned your your first book there, the um, the Wars of Thirst, and I wondered 
about some of your other books as well, the, the short stories. I was, um, you wrote with Edmund White, uh, The Darker Proof, um, the short stories, and um, these were sort of stories from from the AIDS crisis. Um, so it's a topic that you've you've covered before in your books this 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 period in time, and I wondered why it was. Was there something about now that made you want to go back and, and look at it again? Or um, what is it that drew you back, uh, drew you back to that time? Uh, well, it, it's slightly, uh, it's slightly cheat because this is this, the manuscript was written in the period of its present tense. In other words, it was written in 1999. Uh, and it's not that I, uh, you know, I liked it. I didn't think it was the best thing I'd ever done, but I liked it and magazines and a publisher liked it. But for private reasons, I, I quite late in the process, I thought this is a really bad idea to publish this now uh, because I have a slightly unconventional private life with a daughter with a friend and she was then seven and I would pick her up at the school gates every you know, four days a week. And it just seemed as if uh, publishing a sexually transgressive and deliberately unsettling novel was a bad thing to do. So I pulled the plug on it then. Uh, it uh, it corresponds much more uh, in its time of writing to what you were saying earlier about the way gay, pe gay writing is often um, trying to get straight's approval. Uh, this was a reaction against that because by that time my parents were dead. And um, being a well-adjusted gay man, uh, you know, I wanted to uh, wanted them to be confident that I wouldn't be beaten up, I wouldn't get AIDS, and I wouldn't end up on the front page of the Sun. Mm -hmm. So you end up, whether you know, know it or not, as a sort of ambassador for your sexuality, mm -hmm. and you're trying to say, "Oh no, this is it's all perfectly wonderful, and this happened, that happened." Uh, and at this point, I thought, "Okay, let's go the other way. Let's try for something very unwholesome." And uh, let's try not for the most beautiful love story in the world, but the ugliest story that could still be described as a love story. And from mm -hmm. the beginning, the moment I heard the story as as a as a truthful event, I thought this is what's interesting about this is it shows how similar the sort of rape abduction fantasy and the first love coming of age uh, story are in their shape. You, you, they're very different as experiences, but actually in their shape, and particularly in the fact that the other, that the uh, you know the the other party, is not particularly defined. Is his his characteristics are those of the one who makes the decisions or who makes the approach. And I thought maybe I can get away with characterizing Ray very little, with not trying to get inside his head, because Colin can't. And that actually the strength of the two templates of the first love and the abduction fantasy will will uh, chafe against each other, will give it enough uh, odd electricity by themselves. So I was very surprised when people say, you know, what really happened? <laughs> what really happened to Ray? He just disappeared, didn't he? Because Colin had gone on holiday and broken the rules of relationship with them. Oh, never thought of that. <laughs> I, th I suppose it's interesting to think that um, I, I noticed when you were saying about uh, you know why why you felt you could publish this now. Um, I, I think it's something that uh, gay people often experience is the sense of stepping out of the closet and then quickly forming another closet around yourself to uh, you know be the be the wholesome the wholesome gay or the 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 one that's so uh, you know it's palatable. And then perhaps as we go through life, we we step out of that closet into a, a, a more comfortable or, or more daring closet, uh, not closet, uh, you know, freedom of our own. And and perhaps um, the context of this book coming out, it's, it's coincided with, um, I don't know, um, a, another proliferation of, of, of gay writing. Um, yeah, and I'm thinking recently we have books by people like Garth Greenwell, the debut novelist, um, Paul Mendez's uh, recent book. Um, but there's also a, a lot of books now um, by people that didn't grow up during the AIDS crisis um, that write about that period, um, and also films, uh, TV series. Um, and I wonder, do you think, as someone that did, is this... Um, 
you know, is, is it a sense of, of inhabiting or, or celebrating queer history and, and remembering? Or do you find that there's a, a risk of, of nostalgia in, in writing about uh, time periods that we didn't live through, you know, for, for a younger generation? How, how do you, what, what do you think about that? Well, certainly AIDS was very different when you had no assurance of surviving it if you contracted it. Now it's, it's seen as manageable and has become manageable. I mean, it's not nothing, but it is it is manageable. And the feeling was very different uh, early on. And in fact, when the book that I did with Ed White came out, I think there was a sense of sort of horror and dismay from gay readers who wanted, if anything, escapism on the page mm. and didn't want something that reminded them of what they were going through. And I can understand that. But also I think... Mm even apart from the fact that gay generations are quite short, uh, or at least that reacting one style of uh, loving men is replaced by another fairly quickly anyway. Uh, you know, you just have to see the way, the way fashions change, how quickly uh, they change. And you realize that actually, when the prey and the predator um, are signaling to each other so clearly in, from the same set of choices, uh, there's bound to be as rapid uh, change of things. But I think people like me and my partner who were brought up and were out gay by the time that AIDS came out, AIDS was a hammer blow because it, uh, you know, culturally a hammer blow because everything that you'd uh, done to heal yourself and to accept your desires uh, as being wholesome and natural was suddenly ha you had to go into some sort of reverse, find some way of living that didn't so uncritically say whatever you do with your body is your own affair and nobody else's. Then the next generation were brought up with AIDS as a reality had never not known it. So they, mm -hmm. it was always part of their landscape and death was always invited to the party to some extent. And then there's a subsequent generation who grew up with combination therapy for whom there's always been AIDS, but it's not a big thing. Those are the three very different generations. And to some extent, particularly if, there's a, if, there, if you're two generations apart, then it, it presumably must be quite hard to have even an ordinary com conversation about what you're entitled to expect, what the limitations of your worldview are, whether you want acceptance or feel you're better off without it. All of those things change depend on how you are a, a long, quite a long period of time, admittedly anyway, mm -hmm. one that's been accelerated by the disease. Yeah, and I was thinking, you know, you, you set it across the 70s, you know, the period is, is late 70s through to late 90s. So there's that definite sense of, of social change happening as you go through. And I wonder if in some ways you were inspired by, um, I'm not sure if you know Andrew Holleran's book, The Dancer from the Dance, uh, which has this... Um, uh, pre-AIDS, um, it's a pre-AIDS novel and it um, kind of celebrates um, sexual freedoms before anyone knew what was what was coming. And your book is kind of shot through with um, an elegiac sense in some ways, um, because it, it begins uh, with this initiation. Um, and it's an initiation into a world that is um, both fantastical and um, exciting and also dark and uh, mature uh, for, for Colin. Um, and I wonder if if the memoir style of it was, did it feel inherently elegiac in the way that memoir uh, can often be to you? I, I know you have experience of, of writing memoir too, so, it was, so did you borrow techniques across? Or? I, I I, I don't think you have a sort of separate toolbox. And certainly in my case, the project creates the skills rather than the skills creating the project. Uh, I, I think it's fine to be elegiac, not so keen on being nostalgic. So you look at these lives and you think, gosh, was there really nothing better to do with your time? Uh, you know, Colin is the brightest of the bunch. Uh, he gets an education late. I, I, but at the same time, I did want everything to be shot through with naffness, you know, that, that, that very 70s word naff, which I can talk about one time. You know, what could be naffer than sharing a Mensa membership with your mum? <laughs> <laughs> just seemed, uh, wonderfully, uh, you think, beat that, Alan Bennett. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you know, he, 
I did want it to be you to be unsure whether it was ironic or sincere, whether it was funny or sad. Um, I did want that whether it was supposed to be horrifying or touching. I, I didn't want you to be able to disentangle those moments. And uh, I think nostalgia tends to put a sort of uh, varnish on everything. And I didn't want this to have varnish. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. elegy because of personal losses. But when there's that sense of cultural loss uh, that we call nostalgia, if I can do without that, I will. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you, you say that the... Um the the project um creates the tools in some ways you know you you have to adapt to to fit the book that you're writing so i wonder um if this might be a difficult question but what did you what did you learn what from writing the book what did it teach you what did uh, what new tools did you develop writing the book and how did you take them forward uh i i'm, I'm not sure it's quite quite works like that i mean for a start you can learn that when I, when I looked at the manuscript after 20 years, uh, which, and I'd consciously not read it, and it hadn't been submitted until, as it happens, I wrote another novella, which I thought would balance well in a single volume. Uh, mm -hmm. They're both first person, uh, one written in 2016, so much more recent, but set in 1999, and in Kosovo, with a straight narrator, uh, civil engineer attached to uh, NATO forces in, in peacekeeping forces in, in Kosovo. And I thought, actually, this and Box Hill will work really well together, even down to the titles, because Batlava Lake is the name of the reservoir for Pristina in Kosovo, and that's the title of that. Uh, and it even has a sort of balancing subtitle of a story of men and war to go, uh, to go with that. So it was only after 20 years that I took Box Hill out of a drawer and uh, I thought, I'm not even going to read it until somebody expresses interest in it, because I only want to do one edit. So if somebody says, it's perfect, right. then I'll say, and I'll think, well, let's see about that. Or if somebody says, the bit that didn't work for me was, I just want to do it in one go. And uh, then Fitzcarraldo uh, liked it, and suddenly I have a look at it. And there was one thing where I thought, how could I not, you know, how could I have let that stand? Because psychologically, it's embarrassingly nonsensical. It was. In the original version, the two guys sleep in the bed every night. And I thought that isn't possible. You can't have a role-based relationship and share a bed because in the night you snuggle. And you know, what's, what, what, what happens to the, uh, to the division of labor in the relationship if you're equal? Uh, and so I came up with the business about sleeping in a bag and the fact that only on his birthday, which is also their anniversary, and they decide that it's Ray's birthday at all, so it's a triple celebration, only on that night does he sleep in the bed and doesn't really sleep there very well because it feels in the wrong place. I thought that was an, a nice touch, but it basically was a way of mending something that, I'm, I, looking back on it, you think, do you not realize the rules you set up, how can you have something so obviously wrong? Well, maybe, uh, you know, experience taught you something in, in between. <laughs> um, I wonder if uh, you, you, you speak a lot about balance when you're describing your books and, and your projects and, and the forms of them. And I think that's really interesting because perhaps it says something about the way that you work when you're writing and the way that you think about um, the the form of the novel and in this book there are a lot of balances and imbalances and things seeking balance in some ways um i noticed for example um we learn some things about uh colin's parents um and about his mum and then so we have these kind of two relationships that that play off and and colin is of a generation and of a, a sexuality that's uh, that's obviously um different to to his parents so um they live in this um or what he tells us is, is quite a um traditional uh relationship in some ways um or uh, and it has its imbalances um and it's also in a way ordinary in a way that his relationship isn't um and i wonder if there was something conscious about that balancing act and, and, and what uh what you hoped uh i hope to hope to get out of of that foil in a way 
I, I wanted to be, again, there was a bit of mischief because at first sight, there could be nothing less similar than a ritualized sexual relationship between men and a marriage which is of absolute devotedness. And you know, I, I go to a lot of trouble to say, you know, if they were, if they lived near enough to win the Dunmo Flitch, which you get for, for never having had a row, they'd have won it. And then all it takes is one thing, which is the father, uh, the mother to be ill and to be hospitalized. And the father, his terror of losing her means that the relationship goes from absolute balance to absolute imbalance, just like that. And I thought that as you read it, because that isn't the first thing you learn about the relationship, but when that relationship falls apart, that could only uh, seem to strengthen or give possible viability to the relationship between Colin and Ray, which seems to have no safety net, lots of rules, but no uh, guarantee of its viability, and yet does survive for six years. Yeah, you're right. In, in some ways, um... Colin and Ray's relationship is is not as tumultuous as you might expect, considering the the content of the relationship. Um, but I wonder, it's something that you you mentioned right at the start, uh, thinking about consent. Um, and in some ways, that's something that we have thought about more fully in in recent years, and we're still kind of uh, grappling with. Um, some of the gray areas of that and, and how we might uh, define um, the ways that consent must be given or, or, or um, expressed or not expressed. And there's an interesting moment in, um, in the book uh, that deals with, with consent. Um, and I wonder if, if this kind of uh, transgressive uh, boundary crossing was something that you were uh, uh, specifically thinking about um in that you the book almost blurs the lines between uh what is consensual and what is not consensual or sometimes we're unsure if if colin feels something to be consensual or not although in one instance he tells us um he didn't think something was consensual um i wonder you know how, how does that dynamic work in your head because it's it's a boundary that the characters have to cross and and figure out between themselves in some way although ray is quite True, muted but, but it doesn't exist apart from the reader's experience of it and i make sure that the reader is complicit early on because of the way colin referring to you were saying uh, he refers early on to all the things he comes to know about Ray. So by the time we realize that essentially a sexual assault has taken place, we also know that a relationship has come out of it. So I've absolutely, I've made it, uh, I've removed the moment where you could decide on even terms, is this one or mm -hmm. the other? Because clearly it is both uh, at this point, uh, you know, that a relationship has, uh, consensually grown and has in a way grown over an absence of consent but I, I, I was also aware of, of Lolita which was a book which is a book that is still shocking and the reason is that it won't let you make up your mind the moment you think oh he really loves her he says something startlingly callous or then the moment when you think well she's just an object to him there's a moment of extraordinary empathy uh, and that that sense that the bound it's not even a matter of crossing boundaries is the boundaries themselves shift they don't stay put and if the boundaries shift then where is your consistency you can't have it and in life i think you can inspire aspire to it but in literature it can be quite refreshing to have your morals sort of combed back and forth and, uh, mm -hmm. and not to be allowed to settle on a final formulation well, yeah, and I think that's what makes this book so fun and interesting to talk about is that it doesn't really, it's the sort of book that, that by definition would divide opinion because it doesn't give you its own opinion. You know, like we have to decide where our sympathies lie and those sympathies are constantly upended. And, uh, and as you said, there's that um, constant wrangling um, between um, how we are to take certain things that Colin tells us. And it's almost in a way as if he's um, confiding in us, but reassuring us and perhaps reassuring himself in some ways as, as he's speaking. Um, do, you, do you find that you, 
I don't know if you remember now, but do, did you find that you could hear Colin speaking in your head? Like, how did you get a sense for, for the way that he would deliver the story? Because it's quite um, uh, an empathetic delivery. Um, but there's also little moments where you kind of hear him holding back certain bits of information or perhaps reassuring himself that, that yes, that is exactly what happened or yes ray definitely did uh care for me in certain ways or or, or not and, and you hear this um this psychological process going on where he's kind of reasoning with himself and, and trying to convince us in some ways or or reassure us even um how did you come to that uh character and to the voice um well, voice is a slightly uh, painful subject because even though I read a bit at the beginning, this is not my voice. And the moment you hear my vowels, the moment you hear my plummy sound, you know this is not Colin uh, because uh, you know his his background is is very different. I did want him to sound hollow some of the time, and some of the time I wanted to take the piss. Uh, I wanted to make this whole setup. Uh, ridiculous and it's there's one thing I, I felt I did discover while I was writing it is again if you write a sort of serious passage and then an ironic passage and they're clearly separate uh, then that may be interesting you may take people with you but when you start to cut up and make the sincerity and the irony be smaller and smaller units eventually you change mm -hmm. the whole texture of it um, mm. you know, it's, it's like when you make a croissant and you keep on folding and folding or when you forge a samurai sword, something I do all the time, and you, and you constantly uh, flatten and then bend over and then re-flatten, you eventually get to the state where there's an almost quantum element in the tone where in every sentence there is something that is a little bit uh, taking the piss out of the person who's speaking it. And there's a little bit of wordplay and there's a little bit of genuine feeling. And when you get down to that sort of micro level, where there's no big statement of here's what I feel about life or my lover or my, my family, uh, then you make it very hard for people to decide, even from moment to moment, quite what the tone is, what they're supposed to think. But I think that uh, that's one of the great uh, uh, benefits of literature is that it encourages you to wonder why you feel the way you feel. It doesn't tell mm -hmm. you how to feel a particular way, or when it does, by and large, it weakens itself. It does encourage you to wonder, why do I feel that? Why am I suddenly on his side when this whole area fills me with faint disgust? <laughs> Yeah, well, I think that is the power of this book in that it leaves us um, with the sense that it has been meticulously crafted. And uh, I think we'll end it there with that image of uh, Adam Mars Jones and his uh, samurai sword. Um, and I, I can say, <laughs> very appropriate. Um, I can say that um, I'm so excited to read what you um, carve next and uh i can only encourage everyone to go out and buy a copy of box hill it's um a fascinating book and i feel like i could speak about it all night um but i'm sure these conversations will continue uh off screen um with everyone as as you go ahead and, and read this really fascinating um wonderful book uh so adam mars jones uh just left with me the pleasure of saying thank you very much uh for speaking with me this evening and um best of luck with uh lockdown and, and all the writing to come thank you sean i had fun